that I can see what's on the bottom there. It's, it's, it's quite hilarious, but it was, it's almost like looking for Easter eggs. And, uh, it's great, thanks. That's, that's awesome. And it's good to see some of, some of the children here honoring their, their mothers by being here on Mother's Day, too. So that's, that's, that's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, let's, let's pray once again. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to, uh, to be here this morning to, to worship you, first and foremost, but also uh, to have a, a day where we can remember our mothers and, and for the mothers to be encouraged and, and blessed as well. So Father, we ask that through your word that you would give us instruction and exhortation uh, on, this, on this day. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we do celebrate uh, Mother's Day, and, and uh, you know, I hope that Mother's Day isn't just like Thanksgiving Day, which sometimes we think of as the only day where we give thanks to God or something like that, and Mother's Day becomes just the only day that we remember Mother and, and give thanks uh, to her. But the reason that we even set aside a day in our, in our calendars is because it is uh, part of God's heart for us to honor our parents. Of course, in Scripture, and it's part of the uh, uh, Ten Commandments as well, uh, but it is to honor our father and mother. And it says, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Uh, notice that it says the first commandment, of course, the first com commandment is to, to, to worship God and God, to, that we only have God. And there's the four of them that refer to God. But the first one that has to do with horizontal relationships, that's what it's talking about here. It begins with honor your father and mother. And it's one of the ones, as indicated here, that has a promise. That it may be well with you. And that you may live long on the earth. And so... I could imagine the other way, if you don't honor your parents, maybe back then you might have got stoned and then, you know, that you didn't live very long and it wasn't a very pleasant life. But uh, it, it's a promise. It's, it's, you're going to get along with your parents. You, you live under their roof and uh, you're going to be much more happier if you honor your parents. So there's, there's practical means to this, but no, it's a, it's a spiritual thing because in our society today, there's issues with honoring. There's issues with respect. And respect and of authority and things needs to begin, first of all, within the household. Honor your father and mother. And that's why we remember this, this morning as well. Uh, here, can anybody tell me what this is? Mount Rushmore. Okay, Mount Rushmore. How many of you have been there? Awesome, I haven't been there. I hope I can go there sometime. Uh, but who are these people? Anybody know? Okay, they are, they are presidents. All of them have... Uh, of Ben Presidents. Uh, one of them was, of course, George Washington. Uh, there's uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and then Abraham Lincoln. Well, what's all of these people have in common besides being president, have been presidents? What? Mothers. Yeah, they all have mothers. That's right. That can be said about all of you as well. So that's great. We have something in common. Awesome. So the two of these uh, uh, people have left some quotes for us to think about mothers. And it, this is from George Washington. Uh, he said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute all my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. So here he's giving honor to his mother for uh, what she, she has done for, for him. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt also said, when all is said, it is the mother and the mother only who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother, the mother who does her part in rearing and training aright, the boys and girls who are to be the men and women of the next generation, and he goes on uh, to, to say, is of greater use to the community and occupies, if she only would realize it, a more honorable as well as more important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life. She is more important by far than the successful statesman or businessman or artist or scientist. And that is because we don't have everybody being statesmen. We don't have everybody being businessmen or artists or scientists. But as we all indicated or we acknowledged here this morning, we all have moms. And so we all have people who are influencing our, our lives who are moms. And so we want to think about this a little bit more in detail. 
Uh, there are 304 mentions of the word mother in the Bible, at least when I do one of the quick searches uh, for the New American Standard Bible. It, it, based on the version, that may change a little bit, but 304. And so there is a lot of things that we can learn and study regarding the mother in Scripture. But I think one of the interesting studies, uh, 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 in, uh, you know, mothers can be found in uh, studying the uh, kings of Judah, especially after David, Solomon, and Rehoboam. So we'll go there. But even before we go there, remember, there is a passage that refers to a mother, even in 1 Thessalonians that we have been studying. And it says, but we prove to be, this is Paul and his companions writing, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. This morning in our Sunday school class, uh, there was a talking about, do we ever communicate with one another using word pictures? That was a question that was asked, and we looked at the Lord's shepherd and why that was used uh, to, to understand how God cares for us. Well, here, Paul is giving us a word picture of how he and his companions ministered to and cared for, uh, for the people believers there in Thessalonica. And he uses the fact that he is like a nursing, they were like a nursing mother who tenderly cared for her own children. And so one of the first things that we understand is that one of the greatest attributes of a mother is the tender care and affection that she provides for her children, especially or specifically from a biblical term, nurturing them to know the love of God. There is often these, these quotes that are said, why, you know, why are mothers in, on the earth or something to that extent? It's because God couldn't be everywhere and, you know, wanted to express <laughs> his love to people. Um, there are different things like that, but I think there's some truth to that in the sense that when, when a child, of course, the mom is, is nurturing the child even before birth, right? Of course, as, as she is carrying the child in the womb and, and, and providing nourishment and things and lovingly talking to the baby and... And all of her, the baby's life is, is connected with the mom. And, and then the, with the labor and such pain, the baby, well, some of you may be about people, but uh, pain, it's called labor, so uh, the baby comes forth. And then after that, the constant nurture and care that goes on right, right after that. I'm reminded of that even just recently because of the birth of, of Josiah and, and saw, you know, with seeing Psalm and and, and Nathan, and it's, it's wonderful to see how two young, young people, you know, suddenly their lives change, right? And then it's everything, you know, it's, it's that kind of a thing, you know, and it's, it's really fun to see, but the attention and the energy that goes into that, that is something that is given to, to a mother to do and, 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 and show to the children the love of God in a practical way. Well, getting back to what I was talking about, it's interesting to study about these different kings, especially of Judah, uh, after Solomon, David, Solomon, and following. And of course, this is the uh, the line of um, as we as we look at this. That uh, the interesting is most of the names of the mothers of the various kings of Judah, which are the descendants of David and of the ancestral line of the Messiah, Jesus, are recorded for us in the Bible. It's very interesting to read. Uh, through these and look at these uh, different uh, names. And so uh, it says, In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Micaiah. And then it says, Asa, his son, became king in his place. He reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maka. And then it goes on, and the next king, Jehoshaphat, was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 35 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Azubah. And it goes on in Ahaziah, and it goes on in all these names. It's really interesting to study these things. But as indicated in that little diagram there, is that we realize there were some kings that, in, in a sense, we call good kings, which uh, it mentions they were uh, lived or they reigned, uh, and, and, you know, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And then it mentions some kings, which they say that, you know, they did uh, evil in the sight of the Lord, or they put it in a sense, they did not follow the heart of David, or didn't follow in the ways of David. That's the way that it's referred to. 
And then we see also in, in this diagram, at least these kind of moments of what we call uh, revivals with, with people. It's interesting to note that just because someone was good didn't necessarily mean their, their mom was a good influence. We, we see that in the case of Asa. It mentions here that, and his mother's name was Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen mother, because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah. And Asa cut it down, cut down her horrid image, and burned it at the brook of Kidron. Interesting. So there's that case. And then we see here in the midst of what they call a revival with Jehoshaphat, that what did Jehoshaphat do? He was a good king, but he became friends with the king of, of, of Israel at that time, who happened to be Ahab. Now Ahab, if you remember, his wife's name was Jezebel. Really bad. And then you read about Elijah and things. Well, Jehoshaphat, for his son, took one of the daughters of Ahab. And, and that's mentioned, and that person's name is Athaliah. But if you read the scriptures, it's, it's interesting because after Jehoshaphat, of course, we have Jehoram. And uh, regarding Jehoram, um, let's see, where did it go here? Okay, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab did, for Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Here it's interesting because for him, they don't mention the, the mother's name here, but it makes that uh, explanation of, oh, that's who he's married to, you know, kind of a thing. And then later on, we read about the next king who had Athaliah as, as the mother. And then we see how in these midst of these difficult times that God still raised. So it's interesting to look through all of these things. But for uh, both the so-called good king and bad king, the name of the mother or of that king is mentioned. Good or bad, a mother has a great amount of influence in their child's life. It's very important to understand. You can imagine with these kings and in, in these households where there were many mothers, right? Because some of these took on many wives. Uh, in, in these in these palaces and things and and I'm sure there was infighting and different things that were going on that I'm sure they had tutors they had learned people teach them and things but the mother's influence in these people's life were very important and of course in our society today uh, even even more so with the different challenges that we all face but one of the things that I find really interesting uh, to and, and we are all aware of is again this is the line that leads to the Messiah. It leads to the Messiah, it leads to Jesus. And we realize here that not all of these, these people were strong people of faith. We realize that here too, that not everybody followed the Lord, sadly. But we also see through this God's faithfulness because a God continued to keep his promise, his covenant with David. And there are mentions of that in certain places that because of the sake, for the sake of David, he didn't destroy them. And eventually, of course, this line then goes on to, uh, to the exile into Babylon. But again, getting back to the point of the Messiah, the interesting to think for me and, and for us to realize is that one of the amazing things is that the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus, came as a baby into this world. Have you ever dwelt upon this fact? I mean, here is the Messiah, right? He's the, he's the uh, anointed one. He's to be the savior of the world. Why isn't God just like, boom, you know, bring someone strong and, and powerful and everybody will recognize right away as the Messiah. And he comes and, and he, he uh, you know, makes everything right and, and uh, judges everything correctly and, and he establishes his kingdom. And that's how most of us would think. And that's what I think the Old Testament uh, people thought, even as Jesus came. They were wondering and looking at this Jesus, we don't even know where he came from, was some of the response of the people. Or like, he's the brother of, well, there's his brothers and there's his sister. That kind of a mentality. But to understand that Jesus came into this world as a baby is a reminder to us that here we also see God's heart and trust in mothers. 
and that he entrusted to a young virgin mother the care of his son. Does that not blow your minds? It blows my mind to think that. That here is the son of God. He could come any way possible. Of course, we could say, well, prophecy is already indicated to us in what manner the Messiah was going to come. Yes, but when you really think about it, God chose this way in which for the Messiah to come. And God brought Jesus into this world, not like boom in the palace of Jerusalem, like Oh, there was this uh, descendant that, of, of David that we found, and, and, and he suddenly rises. No, it's not like that. He, he comes to a descendant of the line of David, yes, but who are very poor, who are common folk. I mean, the work they do is blue-collar work, carpenter. Read. And, and this is the family in which Jesus entrusted, but he entrusted his son into the care of this young virgin mother. And her name, of course, was Mary, but he entrusted it. And to me, that shows God's heart and trust in mothers. If he can do it with his own son, can you imagine what he is thinking or what he is doing in regards to us being born into the households that we are? Now, I'm not saying that any of us are perfect. That's not what I'm, I'm saying. We know that even Mary, as some have venerated or whatever her, she was not perfect. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's why Jesus had to come, right? That's the point. But it's amazing to think about this, and this is what uh, Billy Graham said, only God himself fully appreciates the influence of a Christian mother in the molding of character in her children. And that is one of the key things. That is the key reason uh, for God entrusting children into the care of these households, into a mother, especially a godly mother, mother who fears God and wants her children to know God and to become more and more like Jesus. And so we get to that passage of scripture, which uh, Alex already alluded to in Proverbs 31, uh, which is often, it's a description of an excellent wife, a wonderful mother, and and so we were going to look at some of that uh, this morning. Proverbs 31, it says, uh, and following, it says, An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Stop there for a minute. Just look at these things and, and, and the mentions of the worth. Again, this word picture, worth is far more above jewels. Whatever that may be that you, you see as the most valuable thing, that it's, it's far above that is an excellent wine. I, I, I saw this note, if you didn't see, uh, where Alex said, Damn, I wish I had a woman, or whatever like that, you know, whatever language it is. But, um, but he said, wait a second, I did marry a wife like that. So, good job. So, right. So, uh, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will not lack again. And again, this is a relationship, and it talks about the trust. So, it's not just about the, the, the wife. The husband needs to, to trust in her. I mean, if God... You know, trust his, his son into the care of Mary. I mean, it's kind of like a trust, a husband needs to trust in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. There are many households that sometimes we go in, and, and, and there seems to be this mentality that the other person, the spouse, is their enemy, right? That's how we, we have to remember that we're on the same side, right? I mean, we have a real enemy who, who sees us as a target, especially Christian households and wants to wreak havoc, right? We know his name. Um, but that, that's not, you know, the person sitting across the table or sitting next to you is not your enemy. But sometimes we, you know, we, we act like that. Um, and, and there's a real, real problem there. I remember as I do, uh, went through some uh, marriage counseling type of things that uh, he said that marriage is, is uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a bombing or bombing or uh, what did they call it? 
It's a disarmament project, that's what they said, because we all have our things like shooting at people or you know, focused at each other, want to shoot each other down kind of the mentality. And in marriage, we need to learn to, to get rid of those and so that we can get along with each other, something to that effect. But to understand that she is there for our good, when God created Eve as a helpmate for Adam, that was the idea that she does him good, not evil all the days of her life. And so, a strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Okay. Uh, she opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Uh, I think that's important there, is that it's not just about uh, what is said, but how it's said, I think is referred to there. Uh, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's working constantly, and it, it was really sad this morning when um, in our uh, Sunday school assembly, the question was, what are some things that your mom does for you every day? And the kids were struggling to write things down. They were like, what? You know, um, and I, I think, um, I, I, so that I don't Entitled embarrass the kids, I won't show the drawings that were made. But, but, um, but you know, I, I think that is this. You just don't think about it. You just assume it or you take for granted. But, uh, you know, moms at the end of the day, they're like, <laughs> why are they that way? You know, it's not just because they're sitting around and, and playing games like a lot of the kids are doing all the time, right? That's not it. So, uh, does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also and the praises and praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. And I think here too, uh, and it's true for Mother's Day when the children are young, you know, it's not the children that, per se, go buy the card and do the gift and thing. It's the husband who does that, right? At least it's in my household. But anyways, um, so here, too, there's, a, there's this cooperation that goes on here between the children. Children bless her, and the husband also, he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. And I like that term, excel them all, especially given what we've been studying in First Thessalonians, which... The, the kind of the catchphrase there is to excel still more, right? That's the thing that we're learning in First Thessalonians, that this thing is, but you excel them all. That's a wonderful, wonderful words of praise. That's saying you are doing your best. You are doing a wonderful job. And we, we honor you. We thank you uh, for that. But here is kind of when you're coming down to the, to the nitty-gritty of it, it says, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. These things about charm and, and, and you know, beauty is talked about here. The reality is that we all grow older, right? And... Uh, yes, we are as husbands to love the, uh, you know, the wife of our youth, it says, right? Because we, we do get married at a young age, younger age or young age. But, um, you know, we're not getting any younger. They're not getting any younger, right? And whatever it was, I mean, along with the you know, different things, it's our, our face changes a little, our body shapes change a little or whatever too, right? Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Because those elements of the heart, that's the whole thing. The elements of the heart are the things that should be, as we grow closer to God and in our, as we grow as believers, actually becomes more and more beautiful. Isn't that true? I mean, the whole imagery that of Ephesians chapter 5 and, and the husband and wife relationship, and yes, at the end, you know, Paul throws in them, well, what I'm talking about is the relationship between you know, us and, and, and Jesus, you know, it talks about that, the church. But we have a lesson there, and, and the whole work of the husband with the wife is that the wife may be made more and more beautiful in Christ. And what we're talking about here is not the physical things, we're talking about the internal, the heart, the spiritual things. And so when a woman fears the Lord, when the woman is, is really trusting in God and seeking God and, and wanting to do His will, that woman should be praised because that is a woman who is more and more becoming a, 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 a servant of God, a, a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it says in 31, give her the product of her hands 
and let her works praise her in the gates. I kind of mauled over this verse a little bit, and of course we don't have gates today, which is talking about it's a place where in a city, it's the common area where everybody gathered. So when it, we're talking about praise in the gates, like let everybody know, make it public of the things that she has done. And what is the product of her hands? I don't believe here we're talking about degrees. I'm not sure, I'm not meaning you, your degree your is an awesome thing. That's not what I'm trying to get there. But I'm talking about, it's not our accomplishments, right? It's about our children, really, when it comes down to it. Because it, for myself, too, and, and that's a struggle, I, I, you know, as I think about things, when I die, what am I going to leave? What is the legacy that I'm going, going to leave? It's not going to be pastoring this church, not, not, not to de 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 make this small, but anybody could pastor this church. But I'm the only father to my children. You know, that's the thing. Uh, Unique is the only mother to our children. And if my children live on, whatever they do, that's by which people are going to recognize and understand me. And so those are the things here that I believe that we're, we're talking about. And, and that's my hope and that's what my, my prayer is. But as we think about these things, and again, the mother that directs your children to God, nurturing your children with the instruction and affection of the Lord, is to be praised. And, and we need to do that more. You know, when we see a family and, and we see them, even at a restaurant maybe, when we see them a teachable moment and, and they're instructing the children uh, in, in the Lord, you know, that's when we, uh, we often just look at the children that are good and go, oh, good job, you're doing a good job with the children, but, uh, which is a good thing too. But when we see them, in the midst of the struggles, wanting to, uh, to instruct them and, and show the affection and, and when the kids are going wild and yet they're calm and they're sharing the, showing the love, those are the moments when I go, keep up the good work, you know. God knows the struggles you're going through. Those are the moments that we want to, but those are the, the times that we really want to praise. And, and many of you should receive praise, receive, you know, good job in the Lord, you know, wonderful at the things that you have done. But we need to do that more. Uh, this, uh, it says, The Lord de delights in those who fear Him, who put their tr hope in His unfailing love. Uh, we, of course, ourselves uh, need to receive from the Lord. But nurturing your children in the faith and love of God is the greatest work a mother can give herself to. We live in a busy society. There are many things. Yes, there's the cleaning of the house. There's the cooking. And, and to be honest, as a dad... Uh, or as a husband, one of the things, and I was listening to uh, Focus on the Family this, this week of a couple of something to do is to share your expectations with one another. What's your top three expectations of your husband? What's the top three, you know, not, and you share it, not what, is, you know, what do they think in their own minds. And, you know, one of the things I'll have to be honest with you, one of my things is I want to come home to a hot meal. That's, that's just me, okay? But in the scope of eternity and things like that, that that's not what's, what's in it's nurturing our children the faith and love of God. That's the greatest work a mother can give herself to. And I like this little quote here by Ruth Bell Graham, which is the wife, of course, the wife who passed away, but wife of Billy Graham. As a mother, my job is to take care of the possible and trust God with the impossible. And it's important to remember that because God is our source of comfort and salvation and therefore to continually be in prayer for one's child is to fear the Lord and trust in him. Dwight L. Moody said the impression that a praying mother leaves upon her children is lifelong. Perhaps when you are dead and gone, your prayer will be answered. I don't know if that's encouraging or something, but the, the whole point is that the things that are impossible, things that are beyond, we need to entrust into God's care. So with that, what we want to do right now is I want uh, mothers to to okay mothers to remain seated everybody else to stand okay that that make sense okay all right everybody else to stand mothers to be seated now I want you to find a mother near you and I want you to surround her so that we can pray for her okay we're gonna pray blessing her blessing her so mothers can remain seated and uh, and others go and. Surround a mother. You can be your own mother. Surround a mother. <laughs> Even leave the mom's here. Yeah. Two or three. Because we need, we need her. Got three moms over here. Yeah, right here. Yep. Cluster them together. <laughs>
this one. Tell me this is the best time for Andrew. We appreciate you moms and, uh, and we, we know that it's not an, an easy job. Uh, even for those who feel like, well, my charter rearing days are over. No, we know the issues of adult children. So anyways. Um, we know the issues of adult children. Yes. <laughs> so no, a mom is always concerned, right? For her, her children and her family. So we want to pray uh, a blessing. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Uh, for our mothers and we thank you again for the mothers who are represented here We thank you for their really lifelong uh, work as mothers that they will always be mother to their children and we ask that you would continue to fill them fill their tank Lord with with your love and your grace and your goodness so that they could continue to share that with their children uh, no matter how old their children may be and Father, we pray your blessings upon them that in their daily life, they themselves will recognize their continual need for you and that they will look to you and they themselves would continue to grow to become more and more like Christ. So Father, we pray your blessings upon the mothers here today and upon those also who are praying a blessing over them with their hands over them. We thank you for this. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's uh, remain standing as we sing one last song of praise as we close our service together.